Are you better off letting the markets dictate your returns or can you outsmart them with a strategic touch? Join us today as we unravel one of the most debated topics in investing, active versus passive investing. With expert insights from Denny Bisson, Portfolio Manager at TVH Wealth, we'll help you decide the best approach for your financial goals. Don't miss out on the secrets to maximizing your investments. Well, we are live and I'd like to welcome anyone who's watching and listening to the Money Mindset and Mastery podcast. And I'm your host, Jim. Joining me on this rainy day is Ryan. Ryan, how are you doing today? Uh, it's it's a rainy day, and it's been raining in waves. So just like the waves of the economy. <laughs> Ooh, good one! <laughs> and also joining us today is a portfolio manager of TVH Wealth, Denis Bazan. Denis, welcome, and how are you today? We're better. Uh, we're actually starting to see a little sun now. Don't know how long it's going to last. We had our rain in the morning, so hopefully it's uh, finished. Well, send the uh, the sun my way. So we're going to attempt to do something today that we've never been able to do in the history of this podcast, which is we're going to try to keep this one under 30 minutes and maybe even 20 minutes. All right, we're going to do our best. Um, but today we're going to talk about active versus passive investing and really what's uh, the ideal to, to uh, or ideal way to invest. And we've talked about passive and active, but we've never really, I don't think, explained the difference between the two methods are. So we're going to go through that with you today, and we're going to get into a little bit or dive a little deeper into what is passive investing and what is active investing. And uh, there's definitely two school of slots. You normally have people on one side or the other, and we might throw a little bit of a twist in there in terms of how Raintree Wealth Management manages their portfolios and what strategy that they use. So that is us in terms of what we're going to be talking about today. And I think, Denis, we're probably going to rely a lot on you, you being the portfolio manager and the level of experience that uh, you have. Ryan, anything you want to add before we kind of dig deeper into the difference between passive and active? I think often we explain things to clients. We want to educate clients when it comes to any of these things. But I think it was great. Uh, for us to have this conversation a little bit more in depth because what happens is sometimes you only retain 10% of the information that we, we talk about with clients. Um, yeah. And when it came to passive and active, obviously we chatted about it the last, last couple of days. It was important for, for people to have a further understanding and finding out what's right for them uh, during kind of the exploration of, you know, diversi diversification of their portfolio, what it means to be active and passive, having a blend of both perhaps. Um, and again, we do this podcast for education purposes and obviously for those watching, want to see our beautiful faces too. So, And, you know, and I'm definitely not a fan of ever really saying one is absolutely better than the other in any recommendations that we make. I think every type of financial instrument, every strategy has its place in people's retirement plan. So we're not here to say one is better than the other. We're just here to explain the difference between the two. And then ultimately, you're going to decide as the investor what makes sense for you. So why don't we get into passive investing? Denis, what does passive investing really mean to the layperson? Well, really what you're doing when you uh, invest in passive investments is you're buying an index fund. Uh, these funds are low cost, easy to buy. They usually come in an ETF as all people use it. Uh, easy to buy on an exchange. Um, they match the benchmark. So really, uh, if you're gonna buy an S&P 500 fund that was just started yesterday, you can still check the performance. You just check the S&P 500 to uh, return. So you know what you're going to get. Uh, some of these indices are very visible. Uh, the only difference between the benchmark itself, like the, like the TSX or S&P 500, is a small management fee or uh, admin fee on the ETF. Uh, and you may get a little bit tracking error, but that's sometimes, you know, one or two basis points. That's not going to make of a difference. So you're getting, you know what you're getting. Uh, they've been a little more volatile in the last few years, but at least you know you're getting the performance. You want uh, you know, exposure to NVIDIA, you know you're going to get an S&P 500, you just buy that instead of the stock. 
So very easy to buy. Can you maybe dig a little bit deeper for people who don't quite understand investing? What's an index? Well, index is, is um, uh, basically, uh, we'll, we'll take the example of the 500 because that's more known, even more than the TSX has changed in the last few years, a few times. It's just 500 stocks. Uh, they're weighted according to the capitalization, and it basically tells you all of them together whether the U.S. market, for instance, went up or down based on all the activity and what happened in, in those stocks. Right. So in this case, uh, when you're thinking about buying it, you just want exposure to the U.S. market. You don't want active management. That's the fees didn't be much higher. You just go out and buy a index fund. That's the same with the TSX. Uh, you don't want an active manager, maybe they're buying too much oil or something or not enough oil and you want gold and exposure of everything, an index fund. You're going to get the full exposure of all of it. Uh, there's pros and cons a little bit, but uh, for the for the most part, uh, it, it, it's that easy and it's really a lot of people that want exposure in a certain area. I, th I think some of the things that uh, people want to consider when, especially when it comes to pass passive is like often I have found so far is that there's a lack of flexibility within them because the way, because of the way they're built. Um, and then obviously, you know, when you look at most mutual funds or ETFs, they're kind of built similarly from, for a lot of institutions. You look at their, and we've talked about this before, we look at the ETFs, we look at certain stocks, and they're always kind of picking the same things that are that are often repetitive. So again, we talk about diversification. What does that actually mean? What does it mean to be diverse? Oh, whether you're in a mutual fund that is high or medium or, or uh, low risk, they're all still kind of invested in the same thing. So it's things to consider when, when it comes to the passive market and in at least in my experience too is and you kind of touched upon it Denis, which is it's not it's not being actively managed hence passive yeah you uh, you brought up a good point what we have sometimes is active managers that charge a higher fee but they call them closet indexers they really do very similar to what the index does uh, partly because they're paid on the performance versus the index, but they're closet indexers and you're paying high fees basically for nothing. So when you're looking at active managers, you've got to be careful on buying somebody that manages in that way because you're much better off in just a index fund ETF and, and sticking to passive investment if you're going to get somebody like that. So when, so when I guess somebody... some, someone gets into passive investment, it's to save money, ideally. Right, it's it's a low cost solution. It is just following an index, and I think we've talked about this in a recent episode. Where if you were an investor who went to one of the robo platforms, because I think robo platforms typically use ETFs or or passive style of, uh, investment of investment. If you just contribute whatever you contribute every single year, you leave it alone. You don't look at the, you know, what's happening in the economy. You don't look at what's happening in the marketplace. You don't look at your account balances or your statements, and you leave it there for 20, 30 years. And finally, you decide to open it up when you're set to use the funds, let's say, for retirement. You probably have done well. The problem with passive investments, so there's positives, again, low cost. Um, the challenge with passive investing is that most people – don't invest that way. And now we have to kind of take into account behavioral finance. And what does that really mean? And that's one thing that we can't measure is behavior. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's really the biggest challenge with if you just go all in on passive investment. If you're a sophisticated investor, you're someone in the industry, you know how it works, you're probably going to be just fine. However, most people don't behave that way. They react to what's happening out there in the marketplace. And I think that's really one of the biggest challenges of just strictly going with passive investments is how are you going to behave when things go bad, right? Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that, Denis? Yeah, uh, for sure, because in passive investing, there's no active manager to maybe minimize the volatility. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're potentially in the TSX where uh, it's a heavy... Uh, and has been much higher, but a heavy uh, weight in energy, depending on what oil does, that can really affect the returns. 
The same with the, the S&P 500 and technology. If AI suddenly turns, that index is going to get hit hard and you will not be able to hide because you don't have a manager selling off or, or taking profits or anything like that. But then you're your uh your passive return index fund so that's gonna that's key and that's a little the um the pros and cons when the market's up passive or active everybody's happy because everything's going up it's when you get the volatility uh that's when people start questioning it and they say oh that's when they're going to start reacting to big swings in the market yeah and i and i've noticed that over the years in the industry and it's not quite looking at passive or comparing passive over active in this scenario. But I remember in the uh, late 90s, when the dot com era was on fire, and people were buying all types of tech stocks. And, you know, the, the smart active managers were a little bit more resistant, because they looked at valuations and things of that nature. And I remember People were buying all types of tech stocks, opening up self-directed accounts, basically saying, you know what, I don't need advice. Look at the returns. I can do this all myself. And then the crash happened. And that's when a lot of those self-directed investors kind of came back to working with advisors because they realized, you know what, not for me. I'm obviously not sophisticated enough to understand and, and make the right decisions. And we're kind of seeing that in the robo-advisory market. Again, there's a place for robo-advisors. There's no advice. So if you are someone who truly recognizes that you just set it and forget it, then that will work for you. But as I repeat, most people don't act that way. They say they they will act, you know, that they will set it and forget it when, to your point, the knee, the markets are performing well. And then we see major corrections and people are I was, I was, I would, now retreating I would, into GICs sorry, I was, I was and daily interesting The behavioral accounts. side of, of okay. the herd mentality. Right? Um, the so let's move on. Oh, oh, go know, ahead. You're talking ahead. to your right. neighbor and they suddenly talk about, I'm getting X amount of percentage points yeah. on, on this. That's when, you know, it starts crumbling. Mm. Um, and I think going back to your, your point about, you know, when the markets are up or the markets are down, um, I think it's, it's just people's time. What it comes down to is their time. You know, Denis, your your life is evolved around, you know, watching how the market's performing, right? You know, we have neighbors that that kind of look at the market or take whatever you know C the CBC is is saying about the market today, but that's often the CBC is reacting to something versus preparing for something that is potentially. Again, we still don't have a crystal ball yet. It's still an Amazon back order um that we're waiting for yeah supply chain issues exactly so it's that her mentality that often supply chain issues and and again you know we look at the crash of the depression you know that's a herd mentality of rushing to the bank to pull your money from which then caused an even bigger issue when it came to the banks right so i think it's Well, I think that was a little bit different though, Ryan, because banks were literally failing and people had no, I think the, the Great Depression maybe wasn't the right example because people but, were literally losing their money. Banks were failing and people lost all their money on deposit, right? I would mm -hmm. say with a herd mentality, I'll, I'll use the tech bubble as an example. I don't know how many times, and at the time I used to play hockey and I would be in the change room and I would hear guys saying things like, they were refinancing their mortgage and they were going to dump a hundred grand into Nortel. Yeah. And I would just shake my head. And why? It's because, well, their brother did it and made X amount off of it. And their neighbor did yeah. it and made X amount off of it. Right. Yeah. So they were definitely like, depending on the stage of the cycle with Nortel as the example, you either did really, really well. I'd say most people did poorly yeah. because they still kept hanging on even when things started to correct with that particular stock. Uh, but the herd mentality is the big one because everyone talks about how many home runs Babe Ruth got. They don't talk about all the strikeouts, right? And whenever I hear people bragging about an investment, yeah. they don't talk about the losses because they're embarrassed by it as well, yeah. right? So you are correct about the herd mentality. We, we do have to worry about that. And that's where the, when, when we see these commercials on TV, and they talk about, well, if you paid, you know, if you didn't pay that 2% fee, you'd have X amount, you know, 30 years from now or, or, or whatever else. The problem is they can't measure behavior. 
that's the I think it's the one thing we keep talking about. And uh, we do have an ebook that we've written about the psychology of money um, and the tortoise versus hare strategy. So I encourage people to go on our website and um, download that ebook. Um, but it does talk a lot about the psychology around money and making decisions and how people react to certain situations, right? So, so I think we need to move on to, we, we, we've beaten up the, uh, the passive side of things. What is active management, Denise? Well, the active science, when you actually have somebody picking stocks, uh, say if you're investing in Canada, they're going to pick stocks. Uh, they're going to see what's out there, look at the um, uh, profits, they're going to look at the economy, and they're going to find areas where to invest and what companies to invest in. Now, in a lot of cases, uh, the TSX is probably an index easier to beat than the S&P 500 is. S&P 500 is a lot more difficult, as depending on what sector is strong, if there's only one of them or one of them is outperforming, and you're overweight compared to the index in that, you can outperform the TSX probably rather easily if you're going to make those calls. This year, it's like, uh, especially with what's going on on the tech side, the, the strongest, uh, one of the strongest sectors in the TSX is energy. Uh, you don't really hear about that. And if you have a manager that stays away from resources and is costly heavy in banks or financials, they're going to underperform. So what you want is an active manager. And sometimes they're not that easy to find. You want somebody who can make these calls on a regular basis. This goes for all the... Um, uh, you know, all the other areas like the U.S. as well. Uh, some U.S. managers just did not want to put that much risk in their portfolio by taking big bets on NVIDIA, Meta, uh, and the rest of them, Amazon. And they were and have been and continue to underperform the S&P 500. Now, that's a case as a matter. Do you want that risk and, and take the returns? Or do you not want that risk and, and, you know, go for it in case it crashes and then you won't be part of that fall. So there are benefits to both. Uh, some areas you may want to have a passive, but some areas you do not want to have a, a passive, especially when it comes to different sectors of the market, like the small cap and mid caps. Those is hard. First of all, it's hard to find an index, both Canada and U.S that could match it. And second of all, that's when the, the active managers could really add values uh, by picking the right companies. Uh, we have that uh, in our own portfolios. We may buy the S or we did buy the S&P 500 uh, ETF as a passive index. One, because we wanted that exposure where our prior manager, active manager was not. So we want that exposure, but on the mid cap, the small cap side, we want active managers because they're the ones that can be add value to the portfolio. And when you look at both of them, and you look at this even at the, um, when we go to Shopify uh, passive investments, the asset allocation itself is what's going to drive the performance. Uh, and that becomes active. You need an active asset allocation. You need to rebalance. You need to sell and take profits. You need to uh, sell completely if you're buying something that's just not working out where some people, and I think we'll get to the behavioral side of this, they just don't like selling uh, losers. They want to keep it, think it's going to turn around, and they don't like selling winners because it keep, they could get in to keep on going up. That's when you need this discipline as well as active, not only uh, managers, but asset allocation to make decisions on both. I could get a little more into uh, the portfolios, but probably for now, see if there's uh, you guys want to add to it. Well, I'd like to paint a picture. Go ahead, Bob Ross, and use an paint analogy here because I'm a I'm a big fan of trying to simplify things for people. Okay. All right, all right. We're going to be flying to Europe from Canada, and you want the lowest cost option available to you. Okay. So this is the passive investment. No human interaction from start to finish. So order your, your vehicle service. It's an Uber, whatever it is, but it's an autonomous, autonomous vehicle. Again, you don't want to have any human interaction because it just adds cost, right? And you're going to get in that car and you're hoping that that car is going to get you from your house to Toronto Pearson International Airport without any incident. Now, some people would say, that's cool. I can, I can live with that. Other people are like, eh, I don't know if I can trust an autonomous vehicle to just get me there. Then you get to the airport. So safely you get to the airport. 
self check in. I've been doing that, and that's easy enough, and that works, and no human interaction. And I get all my stuff onto the plane. And then I get to the gate. There's no staff. It's just basically there's a bell that rings and it tells you when to board the plane. So then you board the plane and you notice there's no air crew. There's a couple little robots. They're going to be serving you the food and the drinks and whatever else during the flight. And in the cockpit, there's no human being. It's an autonomous plane. And you're going to rely on that plane getting you from Toronto Pearson International Airport to, let's say, Rome in Italy. Now, that's the lowest cost option available to you, right? Because there's no human interaction. You're hoping that the computers are going to work, that everything's just going to kind of get you there smoothly. We know there's turbulence. We know there's mechanical issues. We know there's things that happen. So I prefer to pay a little bit more to have a human get me to the airport. I don't mind the self-check-in, but sometimes, you know what, things just don't work for whatever reason. So I do have to ask for a staff member to, to help me with the self-check-in. I like being at the gate, knowing someone's actually checking security, making sure that no one's boarding anything that they shouldn't be boarding. And hey, I love seeing the pilots in the plane, you know, who are going to get me to my destination. Because at the end of the day, there are th situations that are going to happen and you require experience, human interaction, to get you through the turbulence, to get you through the storm, to get you through whatever they need to get you through. That's active investing. There's human interaction. They can react to situations based on experience. Are they 100% right every single time? Absolutely not. But the other side isn't either. And sometimes there are just things that happen on the autonomous side where without that human interaction, that plane's going down you're not getting to the airport, there's issues, but it's a lowest cost option. So pick your adventure is basically what I say to people, right? Pick your adventure, you know, have some assurances that you know that there's someone there that you can speak with. If you have a question, right? If you're wondering, is this abnormal, the turbulence that we're dealing with? You know, you can actually ask someone that question and they can let you know what, you know, they're give you their honest opinion, or you can sit on a autonomous plane with all the turbulence and you can't call or ask anybody about what's happening because there's no one to call or ask, right? Uh, That's I, the difference between the two. It makes sense. How, how did I do with that? Well, I just thought of that to this a morning. Point where Arnold Schwarzenegger comes up. <laughs> does that make and sense? Says, come with me if it you does. want to live. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I'm sure in the next 20 years uh, it will be. But uh, no, a pretty, pretty great example. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, Denis, with TVH Wealth, working with Raintree Wealth Management, the portfolios do hold a combination of both. Mm -hmm. There is some passive and there is some active. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about... Yeah. Um... We made the decision earlier this year with the, the new investment team to start looking at passive investments, uh, benchmark ETF, where it's uh, better suited. Uh, don't forget it's a lower cost as, uh, us as well, uh, by the ASTA being an active manager. We selected the TSX and the S&P 500. One, uh, as I mentioned before on the S&P 500, uh, we had an active U.S. manager. We're paying the higher fees. Uh, but the manager was making decisions to basically really minimize the tech exposure. So we were underperforming the um, S&P 500 index, our own benchmark, by quite a bit. So we decided to make a switch there, and we did the same thing with the TSX. Now, as I mentioned before on an active manager, you really got to find somebody that's uh, going to be active and not stay away from any industries because whatever uh, doesn't meet their ESG qualifications. We were looking at some managers on the TSX that were staying away from resources. As I mentioned before, that what's best, what's one of the top sectors so far this year on the TSX, it's energy. They had very little energy exposure. Now, the only way you're going to get that, along with the exposure you want in the banks, all in one, and make sure it's always like that, is to buy that passive investment. Now, we remained, as I mentioned before as well, we remained 
active managers on fixed income. Mm -hmm. Fixed income, if you're looking at a, a universe ETF, for instance, on fixed income, it's negative up until this day, even with the rate cut. Our managers have been active and they're on the positive by two or three percent. So they're beating their benchmark by quite a bit right now. So it's a matter we want somebody to make a decision on, you know, whether by corporate, whether it be long, whether it be short. That's when we feel we really need active investments. Uh, we did the same on the small cap funds uh, and, and that mid cap level with a couple of different managers. That's where you're adding, uh, again, you're really adding value to the portfolios. Outside that, we invest in things, uh, as most people know now, as alternatives, whether it's private credit, uh, whether there is could be a little real estate, whether it's absolute managers, those uh, type of managers will have the returns irrespective of what the public markets are doing, or that's their goal. Uh, they have target returns on a private share, let's say from 8 to 12%. That's their target. And when they lend out the companies uh, on their variable loans, uh, you know, you're going to finish up shop that year, hopefully within that target. Kind of always going to hit the target. We got a couple that was above that uh, last year. And we're going to have one that's a little below that, but you're getting that stability of returns. The same with the absolute managers that trade and want returns, no matter what the market is doing. That's protecting on the downside and, and well, always getting a little of the upside. They're, uh, uh, I was going to say correlation, but the, the way they uh, manage compared to the market to stay away from those type of terms is, uh, they want returns no matter what these passive indexes are doing. So this really helps, uh, and it really helps depending on the stage of your life that you're starting to withdraw. You do not want to withdraw if the market's volatile and the fund's down, you know, when the index is down the uh, high 10%. Uh, we've seen a lot of periods where in one day they could be down 3 or 4%. When you're withdrawing, you don't have the, uh, the time horizon anymore to recover that because the money's already out, and you're going to continue to pull it out. So that's why uh, on the full using passive and active together, uh, I think it uh, gets you to the best solution. So we're going to start talk closing to this, talk Ryan. To anything else you want to add to the conversation? makes the most sense for you, depending on where you are with your career, with life, what your goals are, um, which is the most important. That, that's why we put these out is just constantly check in what your goals are because if you just as you said in the beginning if you just leave it forget it for 20 years it can do you well for a period of time but in those times that you really need to make sure that you know how tax efficient is this uh where am i am i being put into too much risk as i'm closing close to retirement um or another goal like buying a house it can really put you at a high risk so again making sure that you're you're talking to the right people, your trusted team. So perfect. Well I think we'd like to thank everyone uh, for tuning in to uh, the episode of the Money Mindset Mastery podcast. And we hope that today's discussion really helped clarify the active versus passive investing debate and uh, we're hoping to provide you some guidance towards making informed decisions for your financial future now don't forget to subscribe leave a review and join us the next time for more insights into mastering your money mindset if you have any questions or you're looking for personal advice so if you don't have a portfolio manager to speak with or someone that you or a trusted advisor reach out to us you can reach out to us on our social media channels um, you can come to our website our main website is tvhgroup.ca you'll have access to tvh financial you have access to tvh wealth through there as well and remember whether you choose to invest actively or passively the key is to stay informed and to stay disciplined guys once again thank you very much it looks like the internet uh stayed true for us this time around thankfully and have yourselves a wonderful afternoon and until next time we shall see everyone soon take care Why is